Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Adult Chair on Rashpixel.fm. I'm Pete Wright, and I am here, as always, with the kind and talented and, uh, let's see, today, uh, generous Michelle Chalfont. Wow. Generous. Well, you know, I'm just, Hi, I, Pete. I have this hat full of words that I use for you, and I'm just drawing them. Just drawing <laughs> Thank them Thank you. Uh, we have a wonderful, wonderful guest on the show today to introduce us to a new concept uh, to the show called uh, Voice Dialogue, and we will introduce her in just a moment. But first... Head over to theadultchair.com, learn more about this show. You can subscribe for free by signing up to the mailing list or find us, find us in iTunes uh, or your podcast app of choice. Just a quick search on The Adult Chair and you'll find us. Join the conversation on Facebook or Twitter and call us and leave us a message of your thoughts at 931-463-3813 and get your voice on the show. We would certainly love to hear from you. Okay, our guest today, I'm, I'm very excited because A, uh, she's wonderful and talented, and B, she's from Boulder, my <laughs> place very close to my heart. Jay Tamar Stone. Tamar, welcome to the adult chair. Thank you so much. Great to be here. I am, uh, I'm very excited about this conversation. I don't know anything about it. All I know is Michelle is very excited about it and tells me that I will have lots of great questions. <laughs> I did say that. That's very, very true. So tell us about, Michelle, can, can you introduce uh, uh, the concept a little bit, why you thought uh, Tamar would be perfect for our conversation today? I thought that she'd be perfect because way back when, um, gosh, years ago, I actually found, um, it's your father, right? Is that correct, Tamar? Your father that, and stepmother? That's exactly correct. Yeah. Hal and Sidra Stone. Um, and I have a few of their books and I love, again, it's, it just plugs in beautifully. In fact, um, it influenced the work of the adult chair, um, because they, and now you take a human being and break it up into all the different voices that we have. And I love this work. It plugs in perfectly. So voice dialogue, why don't you, um, go ahead and explain maybe what that is and um, let's start here. Wonderful. Well, you know, I was thinking about the work you do with the adult chair, and and in a way, what the work you do with the inner child, adolescent, and adult, it feels kind of archetypal. Like you're these very um, broad categories that are so rich and so important and so universal. And I think what happens with voice dialogue, which is based on the philosophy of the psychology of selves and the aware ego process, which I'll talk more about, um, it, in a way, voice dialogue or the, the selves can fill out maybe the, the archetypes. Like every archetype, could you could probably say we could tease out uh, um, the selves within the inner child archetype or the adolescent archetype or the adult archetype, you know, I mean, that's maybe simplistic and yet I think it's true. So the premise of voice dialogue is that we all have selves, which I know is very familiar to the two of you uh, and your audience. Um, and that these selves are universal and the difference um, at the personality level is the degree to which we over identify with certain selves, which we call primary, and we repress and disown other selves. Um, and that there's actually a, a mathematical formula for every self that we over identify with that's dominant in our personality. There's an equal and opposite self that gets repressed or disowned. So um, voice dialogue is really a beautiful facilitation process for giving voice to ourselves. And it's like unearthing, un uncovering, or bringing to light our personality. Love it. Yeah, I would agree with you 100%. The, uh, the child, the adolescent, and the adult are archetypes, and they're broad, very broad. And your definition in using the voice dialogue, it breaks down really what's in each of the chairs that I would use. Is yeah. that how you, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it, it, it's fascinating. And particularly this concept of, um, that for every self we over, for every primary self that, that we over identify with, there's another that is repressed or disowned. Can you, can you give me a, a, a sense or, or maybe a, an example of when voice dialogue is really appropriate for, for helping somebody move through, you know, an issue, a trauma, a, an experience? 
Yeah. And, and I want to say that, you know, like any modality, it's, it, you know, it's not for everybody. And for the people that it speaks to, it's like the people who go, oh, my God, yes, this is so obvious. Of course, we have voices in our head, quote unquote. And, and this part of me feels this and another part of me feels that. For those people who resonate with that way of sort of thinking or, or um, speaking or labeling, it's a beautiful process. And um, it, it can be helpful on so many different ways. But I'm trying to just think of a quick example for somebody, let's say, who has a strong pusher, and the pusher is is the part of us who's who's the list maker, you know, who 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 just loves making lists, and you know, before you know, like as as certain things are are checked off the list, new things are added to the list, and the pushers, you might see pushers in line at the neighborhood Starbucks because caffeine is usually their drug of choice and, you know, to mm-hmm. just have the energy to do what they need to do. And in in this culture, in the United States, it's, you know, it's really a pusher culture, if you will. Yeah, I was going to say, how do you identify with anyone else in this country? <laughs> I know. But then the, the then where it becomes problematic is just that when we have strong pushers, when we're over identified with our pusher, it means that there's another self um, that's being repressed or disowned. So oftentimes, um, if you have a strong pusher, you might have a, a being self, you know, that that just wants to to stop and smell the roses that is repressed or disowned, or it might be a couch potato or a beach bum or a pleasure seeker. But it's the beauty of this work is that it's organic. It's, I could not say for anyone, the opposite of your pusher is such and such because it really is unique to each person. But what I can say is if you have a strong pusher, it means that you have a self that's opposite to that pusher, that's not getting enough breath um, sustenance or airtime, and that that creates an imbalance in our lives. I am looking at, uh, right now, I'm looking on your website, as you, you say these, you, you know, you mentioned these, what I'm, you know, I'll call these archetypes within the construct of voice dialogue. Mm-hmm. Um, can you identify some of the other um, other selves that maybe uh, we, we can reflect Absolutely. on a little bit? Absolutely. Um, yeah, so... Uh, they're responsible is a, a very popular self. The critic is a very popular self. And the critic, for example, has a bad rap because, you know, we think that, you know, the critic is critical and that isn't good. However, there is the beauty of this work is there's no such thing as a good self or a bad self. All selves are created equal. And the importance of the self at the personality level is that these are like resources. These selves are our inner family. They bring us um, information. They bring us feelings, thoughts, ideas, memories. And the primary selves are generally born in our childhood. They're, They're born to help us, <laughs> I hate to say it this way, but that's <laughs> the way I say it. They're, they're born to help us survive our family of origin. And I'm not saying that we're all from horrible families, but I have not yet found someone who's from a functional family. <laughs> I <laughs> agree. That's very I diplomatically agree put. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So these selves get born in our lives. Sometimes they're born even in utero with the, with the intention of protecting us. They want to make sure to the best of their ability that we survive. And, but what happens is we do grow up and we have these strong, you know, pushers and critics and planners and organizers and maybe visionaries and, and they're great parts. However, if, if they're still functioning, which they often do, if they're still functioning as if we're still children in our family of origin, then, then there's going to be an imbalance. It means that we're going to have a handful or more of selves on the other side that are being repressed or disowned, and our life is, is out of balance. So the goal is really to get the selves current. It's not to get rid of these selves, like some spiritual practices refer to them as false selves. And I, when I hear that, I just want to cringe because there's nothing false about them. I mean, they really, we would not be here if, if it were not for some of these strong dominant selves who have, you know, kind of fought for our survival. 
However, now that we're adults and not living under the roof of our family of origin or under the rules, the same rules of our community or churches or synagogues, we're, we need to find what's true for us today. We need to get current. So is there a, a process, would you say, that people go through? Would you explain that just a little bit to help find the opposite? Or are people, are people typically aware of the opposite? So, for example, if I'm a perfectionist, am I aware of what that opposite would be? Or is there a process that you take people through? It's a great question, Michelle. It, it, there's actually a process in, in the technique um, a voice dialogue, we actually, the process is you always start with the primary self. So I actually have somebody literally get up and move to where a given self is is sitting or standing or pacing in the room. And I also do a lot of work by phone and Skype and it lends itself as well. But the person actually, it's a facilitation process where they move. And then I spend a good amount of time with that primary self learning about it you know, what its role is, um, if it had role models, when it was born in the person's life. And I just get, a, I, it's like a conversation. It's a dialogue and I get right. information. And at some point when I feel that I've really learned a lot, then I ask permission of that self if we could move to an opposite place in the room to to its opposite without knowing who that opposite is. And, and that's an organic process is finding out organically. Sometimes people might have a feel or a a sense of what the opposite is, but I always leave it to, to, uh, you know, organicity to just see what happens uh, in, in the process. And so that's a, that's the, the self part of the work, but I want to just speak also to the concept of an aware ego, because Generally or historically, the ego is often referred to as like an operating ego. And in voice dialogue, we we would define the operating ego as any self or group of selves that we're identified with at any given time. It's like the lens or lenses we are looking out of. So in voice dialogue, the goal is to disidentify from our primary selves um, to claim, reclaim, uh, energize our repressed or disowned selves. And in so doing, we're creating what's called an aware ego that has both uh, the capacity to observe without judgment, to witness without judgment, and to feel the felt sense of these selves. And it's a very, very powerful process. That is exactly what the adult chair is. So I'm, I'm, I'm hearing it through my chairs <laughs> as you're saying all this. I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, what type of population do you primarily serve? Is it, is it anybody and everybody? Is it, um, who do you see? Who, who does this work for best, would you say? Well, I would say that the people it works for best are people who've been on the path for a while. I usually don't get somebody who's never done any kind of, whether it's therapy or self-help work or self-help reading. It's people who've kind of done a little bit or enough to go, wait a second, this is, this is interesting, or this speaks to me, or this resonates. And so I'd say I personally um, attract a a pretty um, self-help uh, audience that you know people who've been in in the the field for a, a, you know a good amount of time but are people coming to you for things like depression or anxiety or OCD things like this and and do you have good results with that kind of thing yeah yes i yes they they do and and i'm by no means saying that this is the be all end all or the you know because again it's so personal when you're struggling right. with something what um what it, it's not even just the technique, but the person, you know, right. really finding that right fit. So, um, I, you know, I love the work I do and I'm so grateful for this, um, life work. And I know it's not right for everybody. And I'm, um, you know, I, I will always defer to support someone to find what's right for them than think that this is, you know, for everyone, but it does attract, um, you know, the people who do find it often just get really excited because it philosophically fits 
Um, that's, yeah, that's what I was just going to say. You've you've tapped into a metaphor that is something that that people can really resonate with and understand a way to relate to themselves. Yes. You know, just recently, I, I don't know if you got it, Michelle, I sent out a little trailer clip because there's a film. I by, love it. Yeah, by, <laughs> a film coming out by uh, Pixar Disney, an animated film called Inside Out. And it's really speaking to this and, the, and it's going to be cute and fun. And, you know, it, it's not that it's voice dialogue, but it's it's bringing parts work and like chair work, to, you know, the concept of, of selves to the mainstream, which is very exciting to me. Yeah, we should put a link to the trailer in the uh, in the show notes here, because if you haven't seen it, it's going to be, you know, the big next thing from Pixar. And it's delightful. It is. It is. You know, when I talk about the metaphor, like it's a metaphor. I I know. You know, I'm sitting there with my 13 year old daughter, and both of us are saying, "Wow, I can I can really relate to that." Yes. You know, and I always say that even when I'm working with people, uh, the voices inside of us that are supportive are different than the voice of, let's say, the critic or the perfectionist or the part of us that even has feelings. So. I love it. I absolutely love it, Tamar. Thank you. And can you talk to us just a little bit about your body dialogue? Because I know that's another thing that you do. Yes, absolutely. Well, um, yeah, in my late 20s, um, I was um, actually diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, or at least that was the working definition. And I was in so much physical pain in my body. And at that time, I was immersed in three voice dialogue groups in my father's garden in Los Angeles. And I just uh, said to him something, it was sort of, I, I think like a download, but I got this, this realization of, oh my God, you know, if, if we have subpersonalities inside, I believe that the body needs a voice too, and the parts of the body. And I started giving voice to my body and parts of my body and getting so much information that I, I mean, I was blown away at how articulate the body and body parts are. And I, I evolved rather quickly a body of work called Body Dialogue, which is about honoring the overall voice of the body, the body's numerous parts, and truly like befriending the body, being an advocate of your body. Um, Because really, when it comes down to it, there's only one real guarantee until death do us part, and that's our body, you know. It, right. And the body, like the inner child, is often the least valued or recognized or honored in, in our uh, push, pusher society. And um, I, That's a fascinating I, concept, this idea. I, you know, could you, I, I, I don't necessarily want to say, you know, walk me through a session, but just give me, through, give me an idea of how, uh, how you help to let people explore not just you know the language of their body but explore the things that are getting in the way of their well, ability to communicate with their body well uh pete that's it. just you just said it right there the ones that what's getting in the way i call them hijackers and what what they are, are the selves that think they know better for our body than our body knows for itself such as like the thinker the thinker it, it, you know i love the mind i love I love my mind and it has great thoughts and great ideas, but I don't believe even with all the books that I've read that my thinker knows better for my body than my body knows for itself. But you have all these, you know, self-help books or diet books or exercise books. But the truth is not every diet or food plan or exercise system is good for everybody. And when we run these, it's not about not reading or learning about what's out there, but if you run it through your own body, your body can say, yes, that would be great if we could do a little yoga. And I've also known bodies to go, God, no, my joints are so sore. Yoga is the last thing I need. I need something more in water where I can take the weight off. Mm. You know, it's just so powerful and so intimate to to know the body and the cells but so yes the ones that get in the way are off are the hijackers and it's not about making them bad or wrong because it's just about giving them voice and finding out why are you overriding the the body and helping the person from an aware ego to make choices that aren't just driven by their primary self system 
It, you know, it's, it's, it's so fascinating to me because people are so unaware of their bodies until something goes wrong. Like I have a bum knee or my back ache or anything or my foot. And all of a sudden people get angry at that part instead of having compassion and wondering what the heck's going on and what do you need in order to have a healing? Um, I love that. That's, that's beautiful tomorrow. Oh, that's a, that's a fascinating connection too, right? It's the idea that, you know, we do, I I love that you just said, we get angry at our body. We get angry Mm -hmm. at that part because there is this, I I sort of feel this natural sense of entitlement. Like, why isn't this working for me right now? And like, that's, that's the first hurdle to overcome. Yeah, the the part of you that thinks that that the body is in service <laughs> of you as opposed to that it's a relationship. You yeah. know, not right. that it the bo- the body I have found to be the most loyal, committed, dedicated because oftentimes people think that um, you know, they like they'll they'll be critical of the body, but the body isn't inherently self-critical. It's the Mm-mm. critic that's critical, you know. Exactly. Exactly. And the body doesn't usually have a craving for a third slice of chocolate cake. I ca- that's the inner child, the vulnerable right. child who eats for emotional reasons. The body doesn't eat for emotional reasons. It eats because it's hungry. It might need protein. It might need energy. It doesn't eat for emotional reasons, but the child does. <laughs> But we're such a fast moving society. We don't take the time to slow down and tune into our bodies. We don't know uh, what is going on on the inside until, again, something's wrong. And um, yeah, I I, I work with a few women that have breast cancer. And um, yeah, it's like, well, how did this happen? And and oftentimes people are very angry. And, you know, I work with them on let's slow down. Let's talk to that part of the body. Let's find out what's going on. What does it need? Because... Again, we're so unconscious about the body. We take it for granted, I think. so. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. I love that yeah. message. And I think it just, you know, it, it helps me make an even, you know, deeper connection, Michelle, to a lot of your work, particularly around the inner child stuff, uh, you know, moving from the child chair to the adolescent chair and, and right. reining in some of these behaviors we've talked about for me, myself, you know, and, and I think others who experience this, this kind of, of behavior that uh, we don't eat for emotion, we eat for, uh, you know, the, what the body really needs. Yes. That's fascinating. Right. Yeah, it really is. It's like it's it's a relationship where it, it's a language, and we, when we start tuning in, it, it you know I'm not I'm not, I don't believe in denial that there's things you know shoulds or shouldn'ts. It's more like really running it through the body, and the body will let you know if it can tolerate a little sugar. If you eat it every day, it's going to lose tolerance. But you know, as a choice, you know it can handle generally like sugar or protein. But your body can tell you. If if it's like if we learn to listen, mm-hmm. it's an amazing um, ally on on the life path. Well, I was just going to say. I mean, that's actually written on my uh, vision board. The body doesn't need that third slice of chocolate cake. The first two it needs desperately. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this has been such a great conversation, Michelle. Um, how does this, if, if we were to sort of summarize your kind of experience, I'm, the thing I keep thinking about is, you know, uh, how well these concepts integrate with, you know, for example, with the chair work that we talk about, you know, each week. Uh, how do you consider the sort of integration between, um, you know, voice dialogue, body dialogue, and, and what you do? Where do you, uh, where do you move beyond the chairs and, and integrate some of these concepts into the, the experience of exploring the chairs? Yeah, I mean, this is, I, and I already do this work um, in, the, with it's within the chairs, really. So if I'm working with someone, let's say that's, um, I'm trying to get them to move into their adult chair, which in my opinion, tomorrow, it sounds like that's the aware ego, and to use your words, but I'm asking them, you know, what's true and what's fact in this moment? You know, what, let's, and then when we're in that moment, then I want to know, okay, so let's see other stories that are coming up here. And from that chair of the adult chair um, is where we then can even ask about the body. That's when we're slowing down, when we're getting present moment again, when we are grounding and asking the body, what's going on here? What do you need? What do you, what do, what do I need to know about what's going on with you? And I'm speaking to the body. So, um, does that answer your question, Pete? Yes, I yeah, it does. I it's a, just a lovely concept. 
It's beautiful. Yeah. And, and the adolescent, I think, like you said, is an archetype, but it encompasses just about everything else outside of the chair <laughs> that you were just talking about. It's a yes. lot that is in there, but it is the critic, the perfectionist, the judger, the storyteller. Um, the it's, pusher, it seems to be the, say. like, that's the chair where this, this, uh, that archetype is really established where we, or, or not archetype, but where we, we experience that the body is in service to me, right? Isn't that where the, the ego is rooted, you know, and, and everything's about my experience and my body, you know, it's there to serve me. And I think we're just so unaware to the body. We don't pay attention. We just, we're unconscious. We don't stop. Do we ever thank our bodies? Do we stop and tune into the bodies on a daily basis when we're grounding or when we're being present or when we're in meditation or even driving in the car? Do we ever stop and go, wow, you know what? Thank you, heart, for beating all day long. Or thank you, legs, for walking me around. I, we don't, our society is not known for doing that kind of work. And, and from what you're saying, Tamar, you're kind of opening people up into that work by doing this body dialogue. Absolutely. Exactly. No, yeah. no more, no less. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, you know, as we wrap up, Tamar, where where would you like to send people who are interested in learning more about voice dialogue? Um, they could go to my website, which is voicedialogueconnection.com. Um, Hal and Sidra Stone, my father and stepmother, um, is voicedialogueinternational.com, I believe. Um, and also I have a website called Selves in a Box, dot com which is the the house or home of uh, my card deck that i created many years back on um it's like a a modern day tarot using the inner selves which is a very rich way of learning about the selves if you you know in in lieu of a facilitation or a session or it's a, a way you can do it kind of on your own with a card deck um with portraits and descriptions of selves and uh, it, the, and the foreword is like a graduate study in consciousness. Oh, what fun. That's fantastic. They're really fun. I have a friend actually that has your cards and, and she has pulled them for me and they're really fun, easy to use. And you're right. It's like almost having a session all on your own, <laughs> all yeah. by yourself. Yeah. They're really fun cards. I like them. That is wonderful. We will put links to all three of those uh, locations on the internet in the show notes. You can find those again at theadultchair.com. Uh, but this was fantastic. Tamar, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to join us. It was my pleasure. Great meeting you both. And thank you. Thank you, Tamar. Michelle, thank you as always. You're welcome. Thank you, Pete. <laughs> and on behalf of Tamar and Michelle Chalfant, I'm Pete Wright, and we'll catch you next week on The Adult Chair. Adult Chair.